we're <laughs> we're running about ten minutes late. Um, but that that that's just fine. Um, we're gonna try to give Russ until around three fifteen. Um, but appreciate it being here. I know we have some people still in transit. Hopefully they'll be getting here soon. Um, but before we enter into these next two sessions, let's uh, start with prayer uh, together. And before I do that, let me mention again, uh, around 4 p.m., maybe just a little bit later, we'll be um, doing our, our panel the discussion. Uh, so if you have questions that come up, remember to write them down on a note card, put them in that little red box, uh, and then we'll be um, uh, g giving those to the men to uh, uh, kind of kick off some discussion. Um, but let's go ahead and, and begin with the prayer, if you bow with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are such a good God, such a good and loving shepherd. Um, we are in awe of the depth of your love and care for us as your sheep, as your children. Um, Lord, we ask that you will help us to grow, to better reflect your heart, uh, that you'll help each of us in whatever role within your body that we, we serve, uh, that, that we might um, have a, a genuine love and care for one another, uh, a genuine love and care for your people. And Lord, we ask that you will help us to equip ourselves to fill roles of leadership, that you will help this group, uh, that we might be developing uh, shepherds, uh, that we can better function and grow uh, and serve the way that you intend for us to. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So let me let me start by pointing out that um, this is not the first time I've ended up in a situation like this. Uh, some study somewhere, and a group of men are responsible for doing the the teaching. They make the assignments, and you look and you realize, oh, I got the one right after lunch. <laughs> I'm on. I'm only going to keep everybody going and, and stuff. But we don't thought about poor Mark. He, he's got the one after me, after I put you all to sleep, after you were feeling the sleep of the lunch. So you, you may have the worst part of this. But, uh, but we'll get through it, and, and you should feel comfortable doing whatever you need to do <laughs> along the way. Uh, years ago, I was teaching a high school class one Sunday morning, and, and then when the group came in, uh, they, they usually were pretty much on target, but they, they were really tired that morning. And there's a whiteboard behind me, and, and I just started making marks on the whiteboard. One, two, you know, I got up to five, you know, put the slash through it. And in my head, I'm thinking, when I get to 20, we're going to do something different. And they had no idea what it was. They were like, what's that? I was counting yawns. <laughs> and I decided, man, when we got to 20, we were doing jumping jacks, everybody. <laughs> there's no way we're going to keep on down this path. So... I won't make y'all do jumping jacks, but if you really are struggling, you know, just get up, walk around. Nothing's going to bother me, I promise. At this point in time, nothing bothers me. The one thing I'm pretty confident of is that usually I can stay awake if I'm standing up here teaching. But if I can't, <laughs> depending on one of y'all to come help me out, get me through this. All right, definitions. You know, where are we going? What are we going to talk about when we say protecting the flock? So this is one of those where this discussion about sheep and shepherds along the way and, and trying to think of the idea of dealing with individual sheep or dealing with the whole flock, the entire church, is helpful because we really are going to try to shift our attention to some things that elders need to do in order to protect the whole body. So in local churches, a group of people working together, trying to follow and serve the Lord the way that he's asked them to do, if they have leaders who are the, the elders, there's a responsibility for protecting the flock. So I think you understand that part. I thought what might be good from a definition standpoint is to think for a moment about, well, but what are those things that, that elders might be concerned about protecting the whole body from? And some of these, of course, would be things you'd be concerned about for individuals, but just bear with me for a minute. Let's think about what some of those dangers to the, to the flock might be. And I've tried to put a passage along with each one of these because I think that there are New Testament examples of where uh, the apostles or somebody was concerned about a group, a church, that was facing some of the very kinds of problems that, that we might be concerned about protecting uh, one another from. 
a body of God's people from uh, as elders? Here's one. Uh, obviously, I think maybe the first thing that if I'd ask you, you probably would have said would have been false teaching. If there is uh, teaching that's in opposition to what God has revealed through his scriptures, well, we'd be concerned about that, wouldn't we? And, and that was Paul's concern writing to the churches of Galatia that among those churches, there were men that he knew that were out there that were teaching things that were different than the gospel that Paul had taught them. And he has made, he has made it clear that's just not acceptable at all that anybody who teaches something other than what they had been taught, which I think is an indication of the authority that, that one like Paul had, having received that message from God, that what they spoke and said had uh, the approval and, and the authority given uh, from Christ through the Spirit to them. That they are speaking on behalf of the head of the church of Christ. That would be Christ, rather. And <clears throat> yet there were some teaching something else. He said, if anybody does, even an angel, they would be accursed. So, obviously, if there were a circumstance in which that was happening... Elders would be concerned in trying to prevent that from occurring. But there are other things too. I, Colossians 2, uh, Paul is talking about some of the philosophies. There's, there's, there's teaching always out there in the world. We could, we could say, yeah, well, that's kind of false teaching too. But I think sometimes they're just cultural um, trends and things that are not good for Christians to be involved with. Sometimes because they are just obvious sins and wrong. Sometimes just because they will lead you away from God. They're, they're ideas and things that are maybe not worthy of the time and attention given to them. And the influence of the world, well, sometimes a whole body can be drifting because of that influence. Here's some others. What about just complacency? Do you think that sometimes that, that churches get into a routine and a habit and the things that they do by all appearances, are good things. Uh, maybe that the attendance is good at, at each worship service. And, and if you listen carefully, it seems like they're singing as loudly as they, they, they ever did. And, and uh, for the, the preacher, for the most part, people aren't yawning any more than they have in, in the past. But so things just kind of seem to be going along the way that, but that there's no growth. There's no real deeper enthusiasm. And if, and if you figured it out, you realize this is a group that's just complacent. Everybody's just comfortable with where they are, and they don't want to rattle anything. But they don't want to do anything extra at all. That's a danger. That's the whole point that, that was made about the church at Laodicea there in Revelations chapter 3. But there can be the, this, this division and, and disunity. And I'm thinking here about the concern for either some force from the outside that, that might press itself on the, the group and cause some type of, of division among us. I know you're going to talk about unity, so I won't tread too much on this. We, we worry a lot uh, as elders about this upcoming political season. Um, if there's something we're not united on a, as a group of people, the church at Embry Hills, we're not united upon our political viewpoint. And we don't have to be. Uh, there's something much more important that's you, uniting us th than that. But, but what if those things take on an element of importance to us that now it be, does begin to divide us? Now that thing that, that really doesn't matter that we have different opinions becomes something that's critically important to deal with because it's causing division. Uh, so that's from the outside, but, but there can be things from the inside too. Uh, uh, just... Somebody is upset with somebody else. We begin to take sides on a matter of dispute or whatever. And those are dangers to the whole church. There's fear and anxiety. Um, this passage here is talking about the time when James had been killed. Peter had been arrested. The church is making this fervent kind of prayer on, on his behalf. And, and I think it's clear there that they're doing that they're worried they're anxious they're fearful uh, for for Peter and there are time periods when when changes happen to a church that would cause us to be worried about well what's the future here what's going to happen uh, maybe some key members leave or whatever those kinds of things can create a degree of, of fear and anxiety 
And there can just be troublesome members. I, I pulled this one passage out of, of 1 Timothy. You probably should read this one. What's, what's interesting to me is, is that I could have gone to 2 Timothy. I could have gone to almost any chapter, it seems to me, across the two books, that, that Paul just keeps reminding Timothy, you know, Timothy, you need to do the work of an evangelist among these troublesome people that are there where you are. Stay in Ephesus, take care of these troublesome people. Here's some of them. Verse 4, chapter 6. It's talking about uh, <clears throat> someone who is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicion, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Sometimes what happens is that somebody comes among a, a group or places membership, and it takes a period of time to realize they're just a troublemaker. That's really what they are. They love controversy. It doesn't even really matter what the, what the subject is. That's, they, they want to argue about this or about that. What do you do about those? That's a danger. Would you agree? That when you have somebody like that, and especially in a smaller group, it, that, that they're vulnerable to, to that. And think about when you don't have elders. We'll come back to that thought a little bit later. And then, of course, there's the, the simple examples. That's the point made that Paul uh, does to the Corinthians who were tolerating this man who was committing a sin in a very obvious and public manner, and they weren't dealing with it. And it's not just that, that he was concerned about that man. He was. Part of the reason for them taking public discipline against him was to kind of turn his heart, perhaps save him. But there was also that concern about the leaven, about his effect on everybody else. And so the example of his sin was causing them great problems and something needed to be done about that. And finally, I think there's just the discouragement factor. We're, um, Marty mentioned uh, a theme verse of ours. It's actually last year's theme. We just finished. We just turned the page to a new theme about fixing our eyes on, on Jesus out of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. But we looked the other day about kind of the leading up. Why did that group need to, to be reminded to keep their eyes upon Christ? Well, the Hebrews were discouraged. They'd been through a difficult period of time, persecution, even losing a lot of their goods. Uh, and yet now it appears that it's going to happen all over again. And Paul says, you, you have need of, of endurance because they're discouraged and all. And so discouragement that can come upon a group is something that elders would be concerned about trying to help them through that time period and would have that responsibility of, for, for doing it. So with that in mind, that just kind of sets the table. Hopefully you kind of understand the, the, the types of things that we're concerned with that elders should be trying to address. One question maybe that, that ought to come up early on is like, how do you assess that and determine some of this? And I'd like to suggest to you that elders uh, need to assess not just whether there's a danger like this, but they kind of need to know what the mood of the group is. And, and, and as I was pondering this, this more, I, I guess I'd have to say that this is a, I believe it's a responsibility of evangelists as, as well, who are working among a, a flock, a, a group. You got to kind of get your, 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 your hands on, your fingers on. What, what is the mood of the church? So you can do some mood management. Now, you may think, well, that, that, none of that sounds like biblical, scriptural, a mood of the group. What, what is he talking about? Well, let's look at this. I think, I think that there uh, are some very clear examples of where a whole group of Christians had a common mood. For example, the Acts chapter 5, verse 11. There's that circumstance in which Ananias... Uh, and Sapphira have lied. Uh, you know the children's way of remembering chapter 5. They lied and died. Uh, so I thought you knew that. You don't know, let's come to our classes. We'll help teach you. <laughs> but that's about the only one I remember out of Acts. But anyway, that happens. And it's this fearful moment for, for the church. And, and of course, great fear came upon the whole church. And by the way, others as well. It wasn't just the, the body. But it's the whole church. Of course it did. 
You think that got their attention that that happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Great fear came upon them. But here's another time, though, a chapter later, when they were trying to, to address that circumstance with some of the widows that they didn't feel like were being taken care of, and there were some grumblings about that and concerns about it. And then they came up with, here's how we're going to address this issue. And what it says in regard to that plan that they got, and, and this is even before they've, they've executed, this is just really the announcement of the plan itself. It said it pleased the whole gathering. So you see a sense of joy or, and pleasure and, and uh, relief, perhaps, as the mood that the church was feeling there, knowing that a plan was coming. They, they mourned over the death of, of Stephen. And that oftentimes is the, the mood, the spirit of, of a whole group. You've, you've lost a key member or uh, somebody is, is ill and there's this danger there. And so that, that creates a common mood across the entire body of a group of people. Uh, we mentioned uh, Acts chapter 12 in, in, in verse 5, where they were doing this prayer. Don't you think? They're, they're frightened. This intense, fervent prayer that they offered was reflective of their mood of, of fear and concern for Peter. But the point is, is that it was everybody that was engaged in doing this. And then there was this in Acts chapter 15 in, in verse 31. Um, there had been this doctrinal concern about uh, what do we do with, with the Gentile Christians? Do they have to be circumcised or not? And, and finally, there's this clear message that goes out in, in regard to that. And when that message goes out, they rejoiced over the truth about this, about what should be done. That's an interesting word about the truth being spread, everybody getting clarity on something they rejoiced, and he goes on to talk about them also being encouraged by it. I almost see like two moods here, a rejoicing and an encouragement. And it's like we're ready to get going again here, this thing that's been troublesome as to what should be uh, taught or done has been resolved, and they're moving on. And then there's the, it's almost like the, the last tour there of Paul as he's coming from Ephesus down in Jerusalem, and he's told several groups along the way that, that he really doesn't know that he will ever see them again. There's been some prophecies about what might happen uh, to Paul. And in the city of Caesarea, among the Christians that are there, there's this tearful parting. So once more, you, you, the mood is this um, sorrow, worry, anxiety, if you will, as they think about Paul. So I, here's, here's all this mood. And we had all those dangers that we put there before. The question is, how do you assess that? How do you figure out what people are thinking and what's going on? You got any suggestions? I got a list I'm going to put up here. But, but, but what could elders do to kind of know what the mood and spirit is of a group? Or when there's some kind of danger that's sitting out there they ought to be aware of? Well, they can be interacting with the sheep individually to get a pulse on the way things are in the church. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that's an advantage. I want to talk about something to be careful with that in a moment. But, but absolutely, you, 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 you ought to be out there talking, discussing, questioning things. What else could be done? Again, we're trying to get the whole group. So that's like you've taken a sample. Yeah. yeah. What else, Marty? Well, I'll just mention, in fact, there was a photo I flashed through in mine. I don't know if you saw that or not. Just for a second. I didn't say what it was. That was a deacon's meeting. And the oh, deacons yeah. are, are very often uh, very reliable, mature, but also cover a larger uh, set of the group. That And you guys use it all the time. What's the group thinking about this or that? I mean, it's uh, it's kind of an intermediate interacting with each sheep, but it's also pe uh, men who, who, and with their wives, you know, have significant interaction over a larger part of the and one other reason for doing it is because we meet with them once a, every month. And so here's an opportunity when they're in one place, we could, you could ask a bigger group. If there are times when people are gathered in, in a way like that, what else might be one? Right? You were about to say. Congregational meetings yep. or, or Bible classes. I mean, you can just ask people questions. Uh, you know, try to uh, get, get some participation and response about uh, different different 
uh, things that are going on. Do you think that sometimes uh, when you're asking questions, even in a Bible class and response, do you think you sometimes learn something about some dangers of the mood that had nothing to do with your question? It's just, oh, that's an interesting answer. I wonder what that means. I, I wonder what's going on there. I wonder why that was the, the response and all. Uh, okay. Other, any other thoughts? I was trying to think of, of some tools, let's put it that way, to try to assess the mood. And not just the mood, but, but to assess, let's say, what should be the, um, the, the, the danger ranking? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the security levels, you know, we have uh, when, you, when you go threat risk. You know, what's the threat risk to, to the body? Are we at orange or yellow or red or whatever? But you're trying to, to determine some of these things. Here's some tools along the way. You can just survey it. You know, a lot of times we have, have sent something out uh, to all the members and said, we'd like to know the answer to the following questions. Uh, we did that not too long ago, trying to figure out some things in regard to our preaching rotation and, and how to do that. And are we missing some things that we ought to be uh, having taught or, the, or, or, or not? So I think we probably could have realistically expected 300 people to respond, and we were pretty excited. We got 120 responses. Um, you know, that's, but, but, and that told us a lot. There's a lot of data to come through, to think through, and all that. I only say that to, to say, if, you, if this is used by a, a group where you are, fill out the survey. You know? uh, I mean, it really does help. Yeah, you, you want to hear from from everybody, and 120 was enough to have a pretty good idea of what the, the, the group was thinking. But you still kind of wonder, why, why not a response from everybody? You know, the, the more, the, the better. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, you're just trying to figure out where do we go, what do we do? There are questions that elders would like to have. You know, sometimes it's just this engaged group. This was kind of Marty's point about, but here's a group of deacons, and they should be informed and we've got their attention because we meet with them once a month. That's kind of the reason for doing some, some of that. Uh, but but they're, they're godly men, and, and so here's a chance to do that. So some limitations. It's only men. You'd like to have some women's input as well. But, but nevertheless, there are other times when you are with an engaged group. Like you said, maybe a Bible class or, or a group. There are those personal relationships. This goes back to what... Mark was saying, I think that's especially important where you've built a rapport with somebody and you can ask, look, I, I just, we need to know. And, and so you ask some questions about some teaching that's going on that you might be worried about or their insight into the relationship between a couple of Christians that seem to be having this issue that might spread into to greater division and all. And you want to hear from these things. You just need to keep in mind, again, it depends on the group, even a group like this. You could talk to one or two people and get an opinion about something that is completely at odds with the, the, the other uh, 40 people, completely. Uh, I was trying to assess the mood of, of our group uh, not, not too long ago. I, uh, we've had several that have moved away or have decided that because of the distance from the building and different reasons, they're going to worship somewhere else. And we've looked at it, and as far as we can tell, there's, like, there's no pattern, there's no trend to that what, whatsoever. And we're an extremely healthy group left with, with who's left behind. But I could kind of sense there's some people who are kind of worried and, and anxious ab about that. And among those that I talked to was, was Marty, who only saw it as a positive, which it really actually is. Some of those churches where they went needed that kind of strength. He's not anxious about it. Some other people really kind of are. So my, my own personal survey might not find what the true mood of the group is. I might still learn some things that are worth kind of knowing, like, oh, yeah, I don't need to be as worried. This is a good point that you're, that you're making about that. But I still need to comfort maybe those others. We don't do something for the whole flock. But those personal relationships matter. What's interesting to me now with 10 elders is sometimes... My personal relationships say the mood is this, and their personal relationships say it's that. And you kind of have to put your head together and think about it. But the point is we're working toward it. We're actively trying to determine what's the danger, what's the mood. Um, outside studies, I, I put this up because um, 
you know, there's a lot of outside studies that, that, that we don't feel like, as elders, that's necessarily something that's under our direct oversight. A group of Christians decide to have a study in their home, in their neighborhood. Is that a work of the church that we're responsible for or not? Now, we're responsible for those members, so if something's happening, then, oh, we probably should be, you know, so it's kind of a difficult thing exactly to figure out. But here's the thing. If we hear about things being taught there, that, that are clearly not truthful or are dangerous or, you know, maybe they don't really fully understand the implications of something they read that they're doing. That might be something worth kind of knowing. So I think knowing what's happening out there in other studies, um, you want it to happen. You want people to be busy on their own, but you want to be cautious and careful too in thinking about it. But I think about just the observed behavior. Um, and these days, the odd thing is, you would think that the way that I could observe the behavior of most members is, did they invite me on vacation along with them or not? Most of them don't do that, by the way. And so I don't really get to know how they act when they go out of town. Oh, yeah, actually you do. Because so many people want to post everything that they did, where they went, and, and, and what they say about all that is actually pretty insightful and, and all. And it's not a bad idea to have... Uh, an elder or two, or a wife, or somebody who, who actually knows enough about social media to kind of keep track, to, to, to report, look, this is a dangerous thing that's happening, and somebody needs to, to know about it. But you can just, in your own observation, listening to, to members, maybe there is a danger out there that needs to be considered in all, and just awareness of what's happening in the world, what, what's coming next. If, if, it, if it's out there and it's a, it's a difficulty, then eventually it could easily affect the body and the church. I don't know. Any other things come to mind on how to assess this? These, these, again, we're not even addressing it. We're just trying to figure out, hey, what is the problem? Are we, are we aware of some of these things? All right. Well, with that in mind, uh, let me just remind you that it is important for elders to be concerned about things that affect the whole church. I think you already know that as we've gone through some of these passages. Uh, when, when Paul says something like to the elders at Ephesus, they need to pay attention to all the flock. And so there, there's some things that they do that affect everybody. But then there are these examples where they were actually working through something affecting a big group, not them working one-on-one -on -one with an individual sheep either taking care of the benevolence that needed to be done when money was put into their hands there in Acts chapter 11, or working alongside of those apostles, as we've talked about, figuring out those doctrinal issues in Acts 15. But here's an interesting one. Marty mentioned this this morning. Here you have Paul. He's coming into the city of Jerusalem. And it's the Jerusalem elders who recognize that the things that Paul has taught in other cities that they didn't disagree with whether it was truth, but there were rumors and, and implications that people had drawn about what Paul was teaching that could be disruptive in the church in Jerusalem if they didn't resolve that. And so the, the elders proactively went to Paul and said, here's what you need to do. We're asking you to do this. And he cooperated and did it. But the point was, they were doing it on behalf of the whole church there in Jerusalem so that this would not be something that was disruptive to them. They're protecting the whole body in the things that they ask him. I'm going to come back to that thought right at the end uh, of my discussion. So then there are all these uh, flock shepherding responsibilities. I'm just going to try to, to, to give you, just like we did when we were talking about sheep shepherding, I'm going to put several things that we oftentimes say, these are things that you would expect, if you had elders, you would expect them to be actively doing on behalf of the entire church. Sometimes they're, they're protective things, as we're talking about. Some of these are a little more generic than just that. So just bear with me for a minute. Let's think about a few of these. Sometimes what they need to do is make immediate and reactive responsive to events as they arise. I was telling Carrie today, uh, no, it's Kerry. I was telling you guys. We were talking about uh, an elder of the month, right? That's, that's something that, that we have so that among all the elders, if something happens and you need at least one elder to, to get a meeting started or take care of something, we kind of know that month who's got the responsibility. 
Well, among the things is if something weird happens in our assembly, who's going to get up, talk about it, deal with it, address the person, whatever it is? Uh, it's the elder of the month. And one, one time we had, this guy came in, he was wearing an Uncle Sam's hat, you know, big hat. Comes in, sits down, wearing his Uncle Sam's hat. So I went over to Larry, who was the elder of the month, and said, hey, Larry, don't forget, see that, Uncle Sam? You're the elder of the month. <laughs> So we knew if anything happened, he would get up and make an immediate response to that. But you, do, you never know kind of the kinds of things that, that, that might happen that the, the group immediately needs some comfort, some reassurance of, of something. If, if, if uh, an immediate kind of thing happened, who's going to respond to that? But then there's just making, explaining kind of operational plans. I'm sure y'all had to do that even without elders here. When you moved into this, this facility... What's the timeline? How are we going to do it? How are we going to pull it off? Who's going to do what in order to get this place ready so that we can, as a body, come and be back together and worship in, in, in this, this place? Well, those are the kinds of things elders should be responsible for all the time, making sure that something that affects the whole body, maybe you know, the physical structure, it could be what we're going to do in our teaching plan coming up for the, the next year, Whatever it is, explaining those things, implementing them, making sure everybody understands. And then just providing spiritual food. Um, and, and you can think about how that would, would be involved in a lot of different ways among a church. Who's going to teach the, the, the adult classes? What are they going to study? Who's responsible for, for the children? Should we have a, a weekend study with four crazy guys and bring them in and talk about elders for an entire weekend. Uh, that kind of feeding the flock, that who's going to come for a gospel meeting? Should we ask them to speak on a special topic or not? All that is kind of like providing that spiritual food in a way that affects everybody. And those are decisions that someone has to make. And we would say the elders have a responsibility for that. But then there's just the exhort and, and motivate. Um, the, the, the whole group, you know, you use that, that word cheerleading today, right? You know, what if the danger is complacency? And the answer is that, that what we need to be doing is trying to push people along, exhort the whole group. We can do more. We need to be concerned this year about spreading the gospel with our neighbors. Here's a plan that we have for how to, to do that. Here's what you can do individually but motivate people, convince them. They need to participate in whatever that larger plan might be. And then finally, there's just the worship itself. Um, do, do we have those individuals involved in the leadership? Are they doing it effectively? The, the singing, is it done the right way? Appreciate Luke back here working on all this technology and stuff. You know, that, that's smooth and that's not disrupting us other than the guy doesn't know how to use the remote, things like that. But that, those, those, even those small things that make for more edifying worship, that somebody's responsible and watching after that. So those are the, the tasks. And I, and I guess the point is, if, if these are all true, um, that, it's, that it's responsibility of, of elders to be involved in this, then wouldn't it especially be true if there's a situation in which the whole body needs to be protected that they would be involved in making those decisions, taking those actions uh, that would protect the, the entire group. So with that in mind, let me, let's talk for just a moment about the tools that, that can be used to protect. And I want to make one final point back on Ephesians 4. You could probably uh, expand from the list that I'm going to give you, but um, I'll try to be mindful uh, of the time here. The uh, first thing I would say is that elders are actually part of the tool. Now, let's see if I can explain what I mean by this. Remember that one of those things we said is, can be dangerous to a group is that troublesome member who comes in, got a lot of opinions, wants to argue about everything, kind of pushing his way into to this matter or to, to that matter. We have individuals who show up at Embry Hills where we are a group of 450 or so with 10 elders. Those troublesome kind of members come in and have virtually no effect 
on the group whatsoever. Because we have elders. I mean, they just don't have the opportunity to, to, to force their way into teaching one of the classes or into having a voice about how we're going to handle the next major operational thing that we, you know, we need to, to decide. Now, they might in their own space of people begin to have some influence. Well, we're watching for that. That's part of you know, protecting. We'll protect. But as far as a real influence on the whole body, their opportunity to divide the body up is minimal among us. But that's not true of a group that doesn't have elders to make those decisions and, and where they walk in and they know nothing about the past of that church or anything else. And in a men's meeting, they have a voice of equal importance to anybody else. You see the danger that's there? So I would just say to you, this is another reason why it's wonderful to have just the very presence of elders sometimes is a protective nature. But congregational meetings are a place in which elders can begin to address some of these dangers. Let's get, we, we have a congregational meeting twice a year. Sometimes it's just about perfunctory kind of things. Here's what our theme's going to be next year. Here's who's going to come teach the gospel meeting. Uh, you know, other times we're trying to, we're maybe working on a building expansion. We've got some things we've got to explain and all. But there are times when we're so worried about something. And what drives that congregational meeting is from beginning to end, we've kind of identified something we're worried about. I think about complacency. This is a place where you can really address that. Here's the challenges we have that we want to put forward to the whole church for this coming period of time. And, and you got everybody kind of coming together as a family meeting. And we're going to talk about those things. That's a great tool to be able to address some of this. Special studies. You know, you, you, you've identified something you think that teaching needs to be had on. Uh, it could be something like this. At Embry Hills, we're, we've got... A, a, a famous young evangelist known as Daniel Broadwell, good prodigy of Mr. Broadwell over here, uh, Daniel and Scott Kirchival are going to come teach us a series on social media in, in November. It's something we think is really important for the church, so we've carved out time like you have for this study. That's something that could be done. It could be simply your, your sermon topic. Um, you know, that, that the elders are saying, this is important. We should have some lessons on this. And one of the things that we do, that elder of the month has a responsibility to kind of close out the service. And one reason we do that is because sometimes an evangelist may get up and preach on a very difficult topic. Uh, you know, we've got some, some marriage issues, some things, and Grady gets up and he, he preaches on that. And he's had to really force some, some teaching about some things that are important, but maybe hard for some members to hear. Man, wow, isn't it good if an elder stands up behind him and says, that's a lesson we all needed. Appreciate the way he went through the scriptures and pointed those things out. And no, it wasn't easy, but you're endorsing it as well as a way of protecting the group. Carefully planned out Bible classes. Now we have rotation of certain things, but uh, not too long ago, we thought there's some challenges that our younger members are really facing, some modern challenges. I would say all challenges, somehow Ecclesiastes is right. Nothing really changes, but Satan's good about repackaging and, and coming up with new delivery systems for how to teach things that are not true. And we felt like our young people were especially facing that. And so we asked a couple of evangelists and Marty to sit down and put together a class on these modern challenges and target that and make sure best we could to get the right people to be in the right place for that class. That's a tool that can be done. Special communication. You send out the survey, but how about this? How about we just send out uh, an email that goes to every member, we put it into the bulletin, any place where somebody can come across as a member, and we say, here's something we're concerned about. We want the whole church to be thinking of, pointing out a danger, a solution to it, whatever it might be. That, that can be useful. Could you change the worship? We're a little bit complacent. Can you do that? What about, what about a tradition that we've always had? Can we change that? Could we, could we change the order of when we do the Lord's Supper or lengthen the comments that are made b before it or, or change that? Would that be allowed to do some of that and all? Well, of course it could. There's a limit. There, there are things we want to follow the New Testament pattern of worship, but it doesn't tell us how many songs to sing, what order to, to, to do it in. 
It doesn't give much of the details of how to go about doing the Lord's Supper, how long the lesson should be. But, but could you change up something in a way that maybe gets people to think more, to be careful if, if you think the danger is something like complacency and all? Um, home studies as well. Public discipline has to be done at times. If there, if there is a person disrupting the whole group, you can't get them on a one-on-one basis to, to correct that. Sometimes you have to go and tell the whole church. And, and you have to do some things that may be of, of a public nature. All right. Um, and I'm going to skip over this. You can ask me about some of those other things. I want to finish with a thing. Yep. I remember when Ben Hull came, he asked David Maxson, who was another evangelist at the time, uh, did the elders ever tell you to preach on specific yeah. topics? Do you remember that or not? Yeah. And David said, no, they do that themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I think that's a, that's a value, and so doesn't matter about the rotation necessarily. But I, I think that part of being apt to teach, some part of the eldership, one or two of the men, probably should take some of that on. Yeah, we've been we've been fortunate. We have we we rotate through, and there um, are currently three elders that participate in that. Marty's a former elder. Um, Sewell is is a former elder who also is part of that. So. A lot of the preaching, besides being done by our evangelists, are done by some who are either serving now or have served as elders. And there's an advantage to that because what that means is sometimes when I preach, uh, I don't preach on what Kay really wants me to preach on. Uh, I'll preach on something that is, is pointed towards some danger, some concern for the congregation because we've decided that really should be the voice of an elder that's addressing that. And you've got an opportunity. And we, like I said, we've got several men who have the ability to do that and, and speak publicly and all, that's a, that's a helpful. That doesn't mean an elder has to be able to do that, but when they can, they can teach in that public kind of manner, very helpful. I want to make this point real quickly about Ephesians 4 um, and, and try to finish pretty close to on time. So this is the passage that Marty went through this this morning, and he divided it up in colors. I don't have it in colors. He was trying to say the passage is a picture of a functioning church where there's, there are some things here that are addressing the whole church, the whole flock, and there's part of it that's really addressing just individuals. So I carved it up this way. You can just kind of see these three passages or, th- or phrases pulled out of Ephesians 4. I'm talking about the whole body. You're building up the body, the whole body. Uh, the third bullet point, when each part's working properly, makes the body grow. There's a concern about the whole thing, but then you also have this. Uh, The ultimate goal of what the whole body is doing is that you want individual members, individual Christians, to becoming what God wants of them. Their children who are struggling, that they'll grow up. That that every single one of us will attain to the unity of faith and to that mature manhood. That's that growing up too. But to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. I don't know about you. I never claim that I have achieved the uh, the stature of the fullness of Christ. But that is part of the goal I'm supposed to be working on. We're working on everybody in that regard. And so you have some more no longer children, as we talked about, not being tossed to and fro by different things growing up in every way. I think this is about individuals. So here's my question. I'm trying to draw this to a close. I want to give you an example. If, if elders protect the flock, the whole flock, who benefits from that? I mean, is the goal to be able to say, you know, we protected the flock, and if you go out into the world, you will know that the Embry Hills Church has a reputation as being a sound church. And, and I'm glad everybody knows that because we've achieved our goal. We have maintained a sound body there at Embry Hills. The elders have done their work. That's not the ultimate goal. The real goal is whether or not individual sheep members there are growing and no longer be, being children and they're growing to the stature of the fullness of, of the measure of Christ. Th- those are the things that ought to be concerned. But let's flip this around for a minute. Let's say that we don't protect the body. We don't do the things that we've talked about. Who's going to get hurt by that? You understand what I'm saying? Some false teaching comes along, spreads out through through the body. Who's going to listen to it and fall away? Those those members who have been 
uh, grounded in the Scripture through their own effort and, and they're solid in their faith and knowledge of the Word for most of their life? Or is it that new convert that barely knows anything? You know who it is. It's the weak members that are going to get damaged by these forces that come in. If we're not protecting the flock from it, the ones who are going to get hurt are the weakest members. Here's an example uh, that, that we lived through uh, long ago. And I've, I've tried to think back to a circumstance where I was part of a church uh, when I was in college that did not have elders. We had a circumstance in which uh, a couple, a family moved in, and there were some at the church that knew where they had worshipped back years before, and they had some concerns about things that had happened at this other church years and years before. A lot of folks thought that didn't matter at all. What difference did, did whatever happened there, what, what difference did it make? Well, the difference was that we couldn't agree on what should be done in regard to this family. And there were no elders there. There were just lots of opinions. And those opinions did not come together. And we disputed and argued about these things for a long period of time, despite a lot of great effort by, by a good evangelist and others to try to help. It didn't matter. Eventually, this church fell apart as a result of it. And I thought back, it's really only because we do this series, I was trying to think through examples and things, and it occurred to me, you know, if we'd had elders, the whole thing would have played out differently. Because elders would have made a decision on behalf of the flock. They would not have pleased everybody. That's pretty clear, because there were just a lot of people. But they would have looked to the Scriptures, they would have justified a scriptural approach to whatever we faced, and they would have made a decision and they would have calmed the group down. But that didn't happen. But here's the real question I want you to think of. Who do you think got hurt out of all that? Those who've been serving God for a, for a long period of time, their faith was intact and strong. No, it was the weakest members. And so I was also trying to think, well, what, what were we? Were we the stronger? Than, we were the ones who were leaving in six more months. So it damaged us. You know, when we moved to Atlanta, we needed to find a place where we could settle down and kind of recover to some degree. But I was in graduate school, um, and, and Kay, right, right behind that, I'm thinking about what about the freshmen and the sophomores who just, you know, just figuring out college life and everything else. And here they are in an environment in which the grown-ups cannot get along and figure out a solution to something in the body of Christ, they're the ones who got hurt. There's no question of, of, about it. And I think damage went on for a number of years after that. It's essential. When elders do their job, protect the flock, it's the weak who really benefit from that because we want to create an environment where they can grow and prosper and no longer be children. And so that just kind of, I think, speaks to the, uh, the importance of the work. Went a couple of minutes over. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've used it up. We'll, we'll take a five minute break uh, and then um, Mark will start.